Good morning. The title of this talk is different than what was in the program until about half an hour ago. <laughs> the new title is Job in 2018, Change is the Only Constant. That's because in the past year, we've changed the Java platform in three ways that we never have before. First, we took this massive monolithic platform that had grown monotonically over time, and we sliced it up into 26 standard modules. Second, we, we removed the Corba and Java EE modules, leaving us with 19 standard modules. And third, we left behind our historically grand and majestic but slow-moving and unpredictable release model in which there was a new release every three, two, five years, whatever, and we replaced that with a rapid cadence model in which we ship a new feature release every six months on a strict time-based schedule. Now, modularizing the platform and removing some stuff did break a few things. Many have wondered whether the Java ecosystem will be able to keep up with a six-month cadence. Taken together, all of these changes are, uh, frankly, somewhat scary, but they're maybe not as scary as you think. Why did we make these changes? Because adapt or perish now or as ever is nature's inexorable imperative, according to H.G. Wells. Or, in a more modern formulation, adapt or die. <laughs> so saith Andy Grove. We must change Java in new ways because its competitive environment is very different than it was 20-some years ago. There have been two big changes. First, many popular platforms ship new features around once a year, if not every six months. If Java is to remain competitive, we must move it forward faster. Second, applications are packaged and deployed in vastly different ways than they were 20 years ago, whether to the cloud or in packaged apps published to app stores. If Java is to remain competitive, we must adapt it to these new environments. Let's look at the first big change, modularizing the platform. This is where we ended up. Nice, clean, beautiful module graph, 26 standard modules, no cycles. There's one special module in here, way at the bottom, called java.base, the base module. That's, that's the core of the system. It contains javalang object and javalang string and the JVM itself and, and all the critical stuff. It's the one module that's implicitly required by all other modules. It's also the only module that requires no other modules itself. The JDK has these standard modules, plus a bunch of other non-standard modules that contain development tools, the Java C compiler, stuff like that, debugging tools, service providers, and JDK-specific APIs. This beautiful graph is not where we started. <laughs> we started with this spaghetti bowl of tightly coupled platform components with sometimes extraordinarily surprising interconnections. Slicing all this up while maintaining as much compatibility as possible took years of painstaking refactoring and delicate surgery. We were finally able to deliver that, that in JDK 9. Now, modularizing an old code base can be a ton of work, but it can yield many benefits. One benefit is that the platform is more flexible. A module names the modules upon which it depends, the modules it requires, so the module system can ensure the reliable configuration of consistent subsets of the platform. Most applications, after all, don't need all of these modules. If you have an app that only uses the SQL module and the base module, then you can link a custom runtime system that contains just those two modules and the other modules that they need. That's it. It's much smaller. You can package this custom runtime system with your app and deploy it in, into a Docker image or an app store, and it'll be much smaller. We're talking tens of megabytes rather than hundreds. Now, you, you don't need to modularize your app. You don't need to convert your app to modules in order to take advantage of this capability. The class path is still supported. You just make, make the custom image, and there are tools that will help you figure out which modules you need. You can modularize your app if you want, and there are many good reasons to do that, but it can be an awful lot of work. Another benefit of the modular platform is that it's more secure. A module can export specific packages for use only by the modules that depend upon it, so the module system can enforce strong encapsulation. How much more secure is it? Of the six high-impact high zero-day vulnerabilities reported since Java 7 in 2011, three of them would have been prevented 
if we'd been able to strongly encapsulate the JDK's internal APIs. That's pretty powerful. A final benefit of the modular platform is that it's easier to maintain. The JDK does have many internal APIs, never meant to be used by external code. For decades, we've been warning people not to use them. They've done that anyway, of course, sometimes in some uh, shockingly, extremely popular libraries. Now, in some cases, to be fair, developers were after critical functionality that they could get in no other way, such as that you find in the Sun Miss Gun Safe class. In many cases, there were, they were just lazy as well, frankly. Most of us developers are. Um, you know, why write your own base64 encoder when there's one sitting over in the Sun Miss package? Oh, just use it, it works fine. Because of all that usage, we've treated many internal APIs almost as if they were standard. We've been reluctant to change them because we don't want to break people's code. Sometimes we've changed them, we've broken people's code, and we've actually un undone those changes. But all this makes the platform harder to maintain and harder to evolve. With strong encapsulation, we can close off all access to the internal APIs of the JDK simply by not exporting the packages that contain them. Now, if we did that right away, we would definitely break a lot of existing code. So we're taking a more gradual, nuanced approach since migration takes time, especially in such a large ecosystem. Starting with JDK 9 and at least through JDK 11, if your code uses JDK internal APIs, then it will not compile and it may generate warnings at runtime. By your code here, I mean code that you write plus all those libraries you use that you downloaded from Maven Central. We have at this point deliberately relaxed the strong encapsulation of legacy JDK internal packages you know, for now at runtime so that old code continues to run. We'll eventually strengthen the encapsulation of those packages once we've provided standard APIs for the critical functionality where we can and once everyone has had a chance to fix their old code. When we do that, in some future release, code that uses internal APIs will not run. But this is some years away. So the modular, the modular platform does break some things, but it doesn't break everything. In fact, if your code only uses standard Java SE APIs, then it will most likely work without change. Most likely, okay, another qualification, there are some very minor differences. We removed a few, a few obscure, rarely used methods and mechanisms to enable that clean modularization. And there, are, there were a few behavioral changes that are consistent with the specification but in rare cases could break existing code. If you want to know more about this, have a look at JEP 261, the OpenJDK Open website. It lays out all the compatibility-related changes in gory detail and also describes workarounds. There are command line flags you can use uh, to get past, uh, past many restrictions. Beyond that, to learn more about the module system and the modular platform, I highly recommend the book Java 9 Modularity by uh, Sander Mack and Paul Packer. So the modular platform was the first big change. It enabled the second big change of the past year, and that is that we've reduced the platform by removing things for the first time in Java's history. Well, at least the first time on purpose in Java's history. <laughs> we removed the Java EE and Corba modules in Java 11. They were gone a month or two ago. Why did we do this? Well, the details are all in JEP 320. You can read about it there. But in a nutshell, these components are costly to maintain. There have been many security issues in them. And nowadays, they're either available elsewhere, as in the case of Java EE, or frankly, maybe sadly, I don't know, no longer relevant, as in the case of Corba. We've removed some other smaller things, too. As I mentioned, in order to modularize the platform cleanly, we removed six fairly obscure methods in Java 9. Uh, these all had to do with property change listeners. We only did this after analyzing lots of code out in the wild. We actually downloaded a subset of Maven Central and run it, ran it through static analysis. We did this to see if anyone was using them, and very few actually were. While we were, while we were at it, we also removed a pointless constructor that snuck in in Java 8. We removed more methods in Java 10. And these are all in the nature of, of cleanups. All of these methods are ill-defined, actively harmful, don't work, or don't do anything useful. So they're gone. We removed yet more such methods and one class in Java 11. 
As I said, removing things inevitably causes more breakage. To ease that pain, we always give advance notice by deprecating APIs to be removed at least one release in advance and often more. Deprecation, of course, gets you warnings at compile time and scary text in the Java doc that advises you not to use this and suggests a replacement if there is one. As an example of that advance notice, here are the APIs deprecated in Java 11 for removal in some future release. You might notice we're getting rid of a bunch of the finalize uh, methods in, in the core of the system. This is a good thing. Finalization is one of those, as we call it, gifts that keeps on giving. It's almost as bad as serialization in terms of maintainability. So first, we modularized the platform, then we trimmed it down, and then we started moving it forward at a faster pace with a new release every six months. How can that possibly work? That's actually the question I asked when, when it was first suggested to me a few years ago. Well, let's look at a timeline. We shipped JDK 9 last September, 10 this past March. We'll ship 11 this coming September, and so on, every six months like clockwork. A feature release can contain any kind of feature or even a feature removal. For this to work, and this is critical, features can go in only when they're nearly finished. We can no longer slip a release in order to fix a broken feature, so features have to be pretty much done when they go in. But that's okay. If a feature misses the current release, the next one is just six months away, not two or three or five years out. The six-month cadence will enable Java to compete with other platforms, but you might be wondering, quite naturally, what about support? The plan in the OpenJDK community is always to support the current feature release. So each release will get at least six months of support. That's two update releases on a quarterly schedule. That's okay for bleeding-edge developers who deploy to the cloud or to app stores, but enterprises and more conservative folks want longer-term support. So the plan in OpenJDK is that there will be a long-term support release every three years. 11 this September will be a long-term support release, and 17 in 21 will be a long-term support release. These releases will go at least to the next long-term support re release. They'll probably go even longer, depending on what contributors in the OpenJDK community decide to do. Oracle engineers will contribute only to the current feature release, so that they can focus on the future. I expect other contributors to help out with the OpenJDK long-term support releases, as they've done a very, very good job in the past on those uh, in JDK 6, 7, and 8. At Oracle, we're making two other changes. As you may know, Oracle's proprietary JDK, and like Sun's JDK before it, has long had some extra commercial features. These are available to use in production only by paying customers. They include application class data sharing, Java Flight Recorder, Java Mission Control, and the Z Garbage Collector. In order to create a level playing field, we have open sourced all of these features as of last week. Second change is Oracle is now publishing GPL licensed OpenJDK builds of the current feature release. These are suitable for use, use in production. These are for those who prefer non-commercial licensing and they're available at jdk.java.net. So the rate, <laughs> there, there are a lot of misconceptions about the new release model. I'd like to take a moment to address those here with a top five list, not top 10. Number one, every feature release will be as disruptive as past feature releases. No. The rate of innovation doesn't change. We can't, we can't magically deliver um, Valhalla and Panama tomorrow. The rate of innovation delivery is what increases. The rate of innovation will be roughly constant. Number two, non-long-term support releases are experimental. They're, they're just a fancy name for a beta. No, the only difference is that long-term support releases have a longer support timeline. You can use a non-LTS release in production if you like. Just know that you'll have to update in six months or else find someone to support it or maybe support it yourself if you're good with that. Number three, to remove an old feature, it must be deprecated three years in advance since some people will only use the long-term support releases. No, 
that's not true. To remove a deprecated feature requires a production-ready build that issues a suitable warning. Because a working production-ready build that you can run against your code is the ultimate release note. Number four, if you maintain an infrequently migrated system, then you could ignore the non-LTS releases. That would be bad advice. Even if you maintain such a system, it's still a good idea to test with each six-month feature release. That way, you'll be nearly ready for the next long-term support release. Number five, there will never be more than six months of support for any non-LTS release, and there will never be more than three years of support for any LTS release. Well, it really all depends on who shows up in the OpenJDK community. If you want guaranteed support, well, you're probably going to have to do it yourself or pay someone to do it. So we're evolving the Java platform at a more rapid pace. We're doing this in order to keep up with competing platforms. We have broken some things, and we'll continue to do so in order to make Java a better fit for modern applications. Are these changes really all that scary? Well, I don't think they are, and for, for two reasons. We'll always give advance notice before removing anything. We'll only do so when there's a very good reason because we don't want to break existing code unnecessarily. Compatibility has been and remains one of the core values of the Java platform. As to the release cadence, we are shipping a feature release every six months. Each release will be supported at least until the next, and that pace will appeal to some developers. But if you prefer a slower cadence with a longer support timeline, then just deploy to the long-term support releases. You don't have to take my word for all of this. Just after Java 9 was released, I asked on Twitter, do you maintain a popular Java library framework or tool? If it works fine on JDK 9, then please reply with its name and version. Here's a summary of the, re the replies. It's not exhaustive. All of these tools and components and more work fine on JDK 9. In many cases, they worked without change, or, the, or in, in some cases, their maintainers had to fix them, but in most of those cases, the fixes they had to make were fairly small. This list includes IDEs, Eclipse, and IntelliJ, build tools, Ant, Maven, and Gradle, test frameworks, JUnit, TestNG, uh, popular libraries such as ByteBuddy, Jackson, Log4j, Hibernate, Juke, and Netty, and the entire Spring framework. Not only do many of these components work fine on JDK 9, but many are already keeping up with JDK 10 and 11. To take just one example, Sam Brandon, one of the JUnit maintainers, tweeted just recently, a bit of poetry to celebrate the fact that JUnit works great on 8, fine on 9, again on 10, and like heaven on 11 <laughs> EA. My most important advice to you today, then, is this. If you're using Java 9 or later, upgrade to the latest versions of all your tools and dependencies, because everything changes and nothing stands still. If you have questions, I'm doing an Ask the Architect session tomorrow at 3.05 in room A, or you can catch me in the hallway. Don't believe a word I've said. Thank you very much. <laughs>